Hey friends, Jeff here with a new episode of Conversations That Life Science Leaders Aren't Having. Today, we welcome as a guest, Jeff Evans. Currently, Jeff is the Vice President of Operations at Pacific Pharmaceutical Services in Reno, Nevada. Jeff's career has spanned over 30 years in all levels of leadership in both the big pharma space and the pharma services space. And Jeff always comes with the question, how can I have the biggest impact? And that dictates the, the, the roles that he has taken on over the years. As I've gotten to know Jeff, who he is to me is fun and impact. Jeff just brings a joy to everything that he does. And he doesn't do it unless he's going to be able to have a good time doing it and all with the thought of how can we have the biggest impact on patients. I think you're really gonna enjoy this conversation. Jeff Evans, it is, it is so exciting for us in this moment to be talking. Um, I just came out of a, a situation about two weeks ago where I got to spend time with people who I consider ahead of me in the, in the walk professionally and personally. And I just sense ever since we met that, that you're a guy who loves to pour into other people. And, and so I just have been really excited about this conversation. So welcome. I'm happy to have you. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. Um, let us know, what are you up to in the world? As just a grounding point for us, before we dive into some of those juicier topics, mm -hmm. what are you up to in the world these days? Okay, um, you know, what, what I'm doing um, presently, right? So, you know, I, I think you introduced, uh, uh, you know, my career and it's it's been varied, right? And uh, just to, to simplify, uh, you know, it for, or to restate it for your, um, your viewers, uh, I started out in the game in uh, big pharma um, and uh, really enjoyed that life. Man, I learned a ton uh, with Bristol Myers Squibb uh, and uh, I had a lot of responsibility uh, with them and developed great friendships and, and really a great culture um, uh, in the industry and great relations with the pharmaceutical service sector, um, who I worked very closely, um, you know, outside the company. Uh, I also spent some time in the, uh, you know, leading a biotech company, a company called Anka Holdings, um, which uh, tragically uh, was a, a failure, um, you know, as a result of the uh, market meltdowns in, in 2009, 2010 time period. Um, it was also, it took a, a, that company really took a huge emotional toll on myself. Mm -hmm. um, and it, in, in such that um, we had a drug that um, had great potential um, to, to make a solid impact. It was an HDX6 inhibitor, um, and it was you know, looking to be a, a drug that would uh, truly make a difference in ovarian cancer. It's a disease that had not had a, uh, a new therapy introduced um, to it in over 30 years as well as triple negative breast cancer. Um, the emotional toll of that, you know, truly was that, um, you know, here we had a drug that for all intents and purposes worked. We had a rock star team, but we couldn't raise the funds, right? And we, and the, the, uh, the drug was going through the valley of death, you know, that phase one period where, um, you know, many, many drugs die. And uh, they die for various reasons. Some, uh, you know, wow. and none of them make, make a lot of sense, um, uh, which was hard for me to get my head around. Um, it was a, it was a financial play, right. And, uh, at a time, you know, it was, it was, it was the right drug at the wrong time. And, uh, and it really ate us all up because, um, you know, we all knew, uh, personally, uh, you know, folks that were suffering from these diseases and, uh, and we, we couldn't advance a cure. So coming out of that, um, I pulled back and said and thought to myself, where can I make a real difference in the world where I can, can make a difference in the world is I can get on the other side of the fence and I can uh, help lead uh, pharmaceutical service providers 
um, to enable uh, folks that are developing drugs to get to market faster, efficiently, mm -hmm. um, you know, really focus on solid science um, and, uh, and, and speed, you know, urgency, right? Um, and so I jumped over to the pharma service side of the business uh, where I've, I've since I've led a new number of companies, uh, packaging, analytical service, um, microbiology, uh, you know, uh, you know, we, we had a, a, a protein purification company. Currently, um, I'm out here in Reno, Nevada with a company called Pacific Pharmaceutical Services, uh, a company that's, that's entirely focused on logistics, um, taking uh, drugs that are in the early clinical stages, um, ensuring that, um, you know, we get uh, really good, um, you know, secure storage uh, of products, uh, delivery to clinics, which is really urgent. Um, you know, we do probably 50% of our, of our uh, logistics efforts are next day service uh, to clinical hospitals, uh, which is really amazing. Um, you know, somebody identifies uh, a patient in a rare trial. Um, if you don't get the drug over there to get the patient in the trial, they might be dead, you know, by uh, considering the timelines of the larger companies. So it's something I could get my head and heart around. Uh, so here I am in Reno um, and we're having a blast at PPS. So mm. that's what I'm up to. Yeah. And I, I love that last phrase. We're having a blast. And, and I got that about you from the beginning is you're at this stage in your career, you're having fun. And, and I love that so many fun, I think is get sucked out of the room so quick. And, and I just love that you, that you are having fun. Yeah. Yeah, we are. We are. We're, that's the key, right? If you're not going to have employee retention, if every person in the company is not um, 100 percent engaged in the mission and um, satisfaction from that, right? Driving, you know, true pleasure from uh, getting a message from a doctor that says, you know, thanks so much. Um, you know, we got this patient enrolled in the trial. They're already showing, uh, um, you know, progress, right? That drives us all. And, and, and that's, you know, that um, goes beyond PPS. That goes, that goes back to every service company that I've worked with. And, uh, you know, the uh, employees that, which, that, that made it in, in my book. Uh, and, and God knows, uh, uh, I, I, I still have a, an extensive list of former employees that um, I communicate with on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're all on the same page, right? We had fun. We made a difference in people's lives. That's what this is all about. Mm. Yeah, I love it. And that's a that's a great segue to our three H's that we like to ask all of our guests. Okay. Uh, the three H's are a hero, a hardship, and a highlight. Okay. Um, okay, my hero is um, very clearly it's it's Dan von Hoff. Right. Dan, um, Dan is a uh, clinical oncologist uh, with Scottsdale Health. Um, Dan is probably by far the most passionate individual I've ever met in my life. Right. Um, you know, I, I formed a company uh, on Dan's advice. Uh, Dan served on my uh, scientific advisory board. He was only available to speak to me on Sunday mornings, right? I'm like, Dan, why can't I talk to you during the week? He goes, I have patients in the week. And he goes, we, we'll talk business on, on the weekend and uh, you can have my Sunday mornings. And, and it, it's such passion, right? Mm -hmm. Such passion for making a difference in the world that, um, yeah, that, that guy, um, he's my hero, right? It is He really is. He uh, he's, he's out there making a difference, man. And, and, and it's awesome. Mm -hmm. What, what's been the, the, what do you see even till to this day, the fingerprints of Dan on your, on your world, on how you approach things? Um, well, Dan, I, well, that's an interesting thing too, right? So um, the fingerprints on my world, really, it, it, there's, there's two people, 
Um, yeah, so I guess I have two heroes, right? Okay. Um, for, so when I when I founded the consulting company Rondex, um, Exelixis uh, was my first customer, right? They uh, um, they hired my consulting firm two hours after I quit Bristol Myers. It was fat. It was it was super lucky, right? Um, I I told the president of the company that I I just couldn't work there anymore, and uh, I was driving the four hours home trying to figure out how I was going to tell my wife I didn't have a job. And I get a phone call from uh, Jeff Lotz, who was uh, the CMO at Exelixis, um, asking for advice. And uh, that became a contract and, and fact really became the basis of a company I founded called Rondax, which is, is still out there working today, man. Those mm. guys are great. Um, but what George taught me, so I, I did a lot of work uh, around George and with George's people. And when I first got to know George's people, I was like, God, they all think he, this man walks on water, right? Um, why is that? You know, what, what is, what's so peculiar, what's so interesting about this guy? And what I found was interesting is, you know, he would have, he would set up a, a ping pong table in the break room and every day for lunch, he'd put down, you know, whatever, you know, he's public is rated company, right? You know, screw Wall Street. I'm going downstairs and I'm going to go play ping pong with the employees, and built that bond, right? Um, was able to communicate um, the value that they were creating, um, interpersonal relations with their employees. And um, so my so my heroes really were George and and Dan, right? Um, you know, Dan from um, the, you know, he's, Dan's probably the most, um, uh, God, you know, he, he, he puts the patience, you know, before any aspect of his life, which it just fascinates me. Mm -hmm. um, there's, I've never met a person that could do that. And George, um, in his ability to motivate people around him, um, and, and it truly leads. So I, I picked up things from both of those and it kind of blended it into my own style, mm -hmm. which, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So I'll let you go with the next stage, either highlight or hardship. Mm, mm. Um, wow. So hardship. Uh, let me jump right in on that. Right. Um, the greatest hardship. And I don't know. I mean, I mean it's a tragedy. Right. Um, you know, when I go back to Uncle Holdings, um, you know, I go back to uh, um, uh, the Carol gig. There's a foundation in Syracuse, New York, the Carol Baldwin Foundation. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, Carol uh, passed away this year. Mm. Uh, but Carol is the mother of the famous Baldwin brothers, you know, the actors, right? Um, and here's another person, right, that just totally got it. Uh, Carol had a foundation for breast cancer patients that um, it wasn't about raising money. It wasn't about, you know, rubbing elbows with, with you know, uh, you know, these hotty toddy uh, people, right? Her deal was she would go in the um, doctor's office with somebody that was um, using her the services of her foundation, hold their hand while the doctor is giving the patient the prognosis. And it, it, which, as you can imagine, you know, being told that you've got a life threatening, uh, you know, uh, illness and uh, God, you know, the words are huge and, and you have your mind's racing. You have no idea what's going on. Well, Carol would be in there holding her hand and then walking them out of the office and saying things like, okay, this is what was really said. And, uh, oh, by the way, um, I got, I've got people on my team. They're going to come by and they're going to, they're going to manage your household for you. They're going to wash your dishes, work, do your carpets. So you can focus on getting better and not worry about, you know, uh, whether or not your kids, uh, have, uh, a clean house to live in or, uh, you know, yada, yada, right. It was just anything you need. Yeah. So she was, she was an awesome lady. And, uh, so I got invited when I was at uncle holdings, um, uh, you know, right after we had run out of cash, I got invited to sit at the head table with her at her foundation dinner. I look around this room and there's a thousand seats in the room and, uh, every 10th seat was tipped. And uh, was, I thought it was bizarre. And uh, mm. so I lean over to Carol. I said, what, what's that about? And she goes, um, Jeff, those are the family members that couldn't be with us here today. 
but don't worry, um, you're going to solve that problem, mm. right? Um, total emotional hit right there. Boom. You want to rip your guts out when you know that you've got a drug that could work and, uh, um, and, and expectations from folks that you're going to deliver on that. So that the greatest hardship was overcoming um, that type of vibe, right? Is um, the expectation from folks that you're going to solve, you're going to be Superman, right? That's a hard, that's a hard place to be. Yeah. Um, so there you go. That's, I mean, that, and that's one I haven't overcome to be quite honest with you. Right. Um, that, uh, that's, that hardship is what's driven me and, and kept me, um, in the business, um, through all my gray hairs. Um, this is, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the problems in the world we're trying to solve are bigger than Jeff, right? They're, they're bigger than either, either Jeff, in, yeah, um, yes, all, yes. right? Um, so, uh, so that would be my greatest hardship. And I, I can't tell you how I've overcome it because I haven't. Mm. And how about your highlight? Um, gosh, highlight. Uh, you know, I, I've had a career that's just totally full of highlights. Um, I, I've, I've had, um, had great successes and, and highlights. There's not one you could put your finger on. The highlights happen, you know, regularly, right? It's, um, I helped launch a drug. Um, actually, I led the manufacturing launch team uh, while I was at Bristol for a drug called Baraclude. And, you know, that was the, the first highlight was getting a, a, a note from a, from a patient through their doctor about how this drug that we provided um, uh, made a, a huge difference in their life, right? Um, got them got them out of, of uh, you know, I won't go into details, but, and and getting that type of, uh, my highlights happen uh, at least annually when you get that type of feedback, you know, probably quarterly um, that you've made an, an impact. So there's not one highlight in this business. It's just a string of really cool things when you've made a difference. Mm. It just, it really strikes me, Jeff, that this journey, I mean, you, you're you not currently CEO, but you've been CEO at, at multiple mm -hmm. stops. It just, it just strikes me that the, you're you're not in this to just climb the ladder of career success. That no. that that all the roles that you've taken have been in service of those 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 monthly, weekly, yearly highlights that you get where you get that news. It, mm -hmm. it and that's unique. I don't know that everybody would admit that they're on the path that they're on to achieve career success. There's nothing wrong with that, but it just that you're in this for different reasons. Yeah, it, I'm not unique, right? Um, you know, you look around. There's a lot of folks like me out there. Um, there's a lot of them that um, will never attain the role of CEO, um, and and really, I, I don't attribute that to anything special about myself. It's it's more about being in the right place at the right time you know, with the uh, proper decision makers, um, having the courage um, to fail, right? Uh, to jump out there. Um, when I founded Rondax, I mean, that was a, uh, it was a, a type of consulting company that did not exist. Um, it was, the world was full of naysayers that there's no way this would ever be successful. And, uh, and damn it, I, I had I was out there to to make make a difference. I mean, the whole reason I founded Rondax was at the towards the end of my career um, at, at Bristol Myers, in addition to be responsible for worldwide worldwide uh, sourcing and planning, um, I took on all of the uh, due diligence activities from the CMC perspective for the company, and we would go in and we would evaluate um, programs, right? Um, my role in, in, in those discussions were really to over-exaggerate time to filing, over-exaggerate the cost of manufacture, yada, 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 drive the price down. Right. Um, I was the, uh, the bad guy in the room and, uh, this one, this one particular meeting I was at, um, I was across the table from a former colleague, uh, head of uh, clinical research, Gino Linaz. Um, who used to be at, at Bristol and he was off in this biotech. And we went out for dinner that night. And I said, Gino, 
I'm kicking your butt in the, in the discussions. Why aren't you defending yourself? And Gina says, because at this point, you know, you got to remember, this is the um, late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, Gino, you know, the biotech industry was pretty um, young. Um, they hadn't really uh, achieved great commercial successes. So there was not a lot of knowledge there. And he's like, Jeff, we don't know how to in our industry, right? We, we haven't learned that yet. Um, why don't, he goes, we, we, we wish we had somebody like you on our side of the table. And at that point, it was done, right? Business, business plan was being written. Um, here's a chance to make a difference. And also, here's a chance to, you know, dramatically fail, walk away from a cush job um, and uh, with all kinds of financial security and, uh, and start something up that, you know, literally doesn't have, um, you know, any uh, financial future beyond maybe 30 days, right? Mm -hmm. So that was cool. And uh, man, it was it was great that, that we succeeded. We, we became, uh, I think, it in my heyday there, we had sixty three uh, pharma execs, uh, mm -hmm. on, you know, working for us, which yeah. was really awesome. Yeah, it 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 seems, Jeff, that that whatever the role is that 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 that's there to be filled, whatever that call we we'll call it a calling, whatever whatever that is. It, it you're willing to take whatever seat you need to take in order to have make the impact that you see is possible. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I mean it's um, my fear of failure is different than most people's fear of failure, right? Um, I'm not afraid to be homeless. Um, I'm afraid to be insignificant. Mm. I think you know, right? Yeah. I, that. That belongs on a plaque on on my wall for for sure. Uh, uh, that's that's profound. I I pulled that one out of the air, and I'm sorry. No, when, when you write it down. I'll use it again. I, I will write it down. I will attribute <laughs> it to you forever and ever. That's there you go. really really powerful. And you know, in, in this world of the in the life science space of making an impact, it you have all you have so many stakeholders. So mm -hmm. you have the patient, mm -hmm. you have your team or employees, and under most, at a certain point, you have shareholders, mm -hmm. you have a board, stockholders, shareholders. So in, in your mission to have an impact, to, to be significant, how have you learned to negotiate, to manage or balance the needs of all three of those, those groups? Um, understand, you know, right out of the gate, right? You have to understand that um, your investors are only going to be satisfied with success, right? Um, however, if you go preaching success um, to your employees, if you go preaching success to your patients, they don't give a damn, right? Um you know, if uh, we're going to if we're going to we're going to make the game all about uh, great financial success. Well, my employees, um, they're just going to be in it for for the money. Right. And, and it's not a you, you can't promise, you know, uh, uh, a bottomless pit of cash. So it, it doesn't get you anywhere. Your patients don't give a dang about any of that. Right. Um, they just want to feel better. Hmm. So I, I turn the whole table around, right? I I, I stay focused on uh, patient welfare, right? And then let's walk that back because really that's what everything is about. Um, if I've got a patient um, that is in a better place or not, you know, I don't have a patient. If Dan has a patient or, or, or some other great doctor has a patient that's in a better place because of things that we have enabled, OK, then we can feel really good about ourselves. Um, and if we feel really good our, about ourselves, employee morale right, is in a, keep focused on, you know, what we're doing to impact the patients that's going through the roof. And if I've got happy employees and living patients, um, the money's going to follow. Right. My investors are going to be happy because no matter what, um, they're going to make more money. Right. Mm -hmm. So I kind of reversed the whole equation. And I've, I've seen this, 
with a, a lot of my colleagues, um, especially in the service business, right? The service business is primarily driven by, um, you know, private equity. Um, and, you know, and I've had some great PE investors and companies that I've, I've worked for. Um, you know, Ed, most recently, Edgewater Capital, man, those guys were awesome, right? Um, they get the patient impact thing, but they still have to answer to their um, investors, you know, in their funds, you know, on financial performance. So shareholder value really, um, you know, I drive it from the patient forward. Okay. I drive it into the employees um, that their impact on patients and you can't, it is the hardest part of that whole equation is how do you communicate to your employees the impact that you're having on patients, mm -hmm. right? You can have a company-wide meeting. You can stand up and, you know, be, beat our chest and say, we know what a great deal we, you know, job we did. Um, that, that works for about 20% of the employees. The other 80% just don't get it, right? Um, either they missed part of the equation or, um, you know, they're off having a coffee or whatever. So I've, I've always found that, um, in, in my world, I've always had to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction. And whenever I have a one-on-one -on -one interaction with an employee, um, in addition to finding out what's important in their world, I make sure they understand the impact they're making on the patient's world. Okay. That's key. Um, you know, we, you know, in, in our world, right. Um, Hey, Thanks for thanks for uh, getting that rush order out. Um, you know, we heard back that uh, uh, the drug was what was received at the hospital, and the, the patients uh, uh, enrolled and in, in uh, receiving all the benefit. Mm. Um, or uh, you know, a great example was when I was with uh, Hematological Technology. So I was I was interim CEO at at Hemtech, and um, you know that was a really cool company where. Uh, there was um, blood plasma proteins that were deficient in certain patient populations. I won't, I won't go into you know, full detail, so I'll bore the heck out of everybody. Um, but uh, just having, there was a famous politician whose daughter suffered from this, and he got on, on board and, uh, and uh, was, was working to, to help things, you know, to move things forward. Having him come on site, right, you know, um, informally. Um, talk to my employees, tell them, you know, the, the struggles that your daughter has uh, had. And he was a great, great speaker. Um, so he was very good at it. But tell people, you know, give them an attaboy, give them a pat on the back. Um, this is the great impact that you're making on the world. And you're helping somebody, you know, where you can see it in their eyes, right? You're, you're making that difference. You know, at, at Hemtech, um, I think I had just, I lost one employee over my whole time there, right? It, which was huge. And, and, I, and I look back at my career and I've had, and, and not banging my own chest here, but I've had great success with this uh, model of retaining employees. Um, I've never really had uh, an employee retention issue. And in, in many cases, I've doubled uh, the size of companies just by preaching that, you know, it's, this is not a hard formula, right? Be, be genuine, talk about your patient. Um, folks are going to want to stay with you. Folks are going to want to um, help you solve this big problem, benefit humanity. And, uh, and with all that, right, your investors, they're thrilled because you're not, you're not out hiring new employees. The ones you have are really smart. Um, they're making a huge, you know, impact every day. And um, so your investors are thrilled. That, that's how that works. Mm. So this, there's a, a picture that is forming for me. This this one element of your of your leadership of patient centered, patient forward, patient well being, um, is is one element. And you talked before when you were uh, reflecting on Dan and George, and you said, out of that, I formed my own leadership approach. So with this being one of them, being patient forward, what are some of the other elements that have, that you've developed in terms of, you would say, is your style in leading organizations? Um, 
be seen. Mm. Okay. When you're the leader of an organization, um, there's very little that you can do that's going to ha have a meaningful difference on the company in, you know, a half hour's time, right? More than leveraging uh, the um, the power of your staff, right? So my number one thing that I do um, every day when I'm leading the company is I walk in the office, I drop my laptop on the desk, okay, and I walk away from it. I don't care which investor's calling. I don't care that my chairman of the board's upset because some number is goofy. I grab a cup of coffee and I walk around the whole company and I make sure that every employee minimally gets a good morning from me. Uh, hello. Um, if I get an opportunity to stop and have a conversation, you know, I'll talk about that patient impact, you know, just drop those little pieces. Hey man, thanks so much. You know, this made a big difference. If I don't have a patient impact story, um, you know, Hey, how'd your kids uh, ball game go last week or, or something like that. You know, just, just in order to ensure that we have that personal contact that, you know, we're all on that same team. Okay. And, and they get it right. They expect it. And, and what's cool is after about a month or two of that, folks are like at their desks waiting, you know, for me to come around because they want to tell me something cool. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, they want to tell me, you know, how they made a patient impact. And uh, that, that, that's awesome, right? That, that becomes, um, you know, not many people, not many CEOs allow themselves, right, to hear from, you know, the guy that's the head of the stock room or, uh, or the warehouse or, um, or, you know, one of your uh, entry level analysts, right, that, that just completed a really cool assay or, or just isolated a really cool protein. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's some big, that's some big stuff in their world. They feel like they're part of the team. This is not, they're not a number, right? It was the old Bob Seger song, you know, uh, I feel like a number is the antithesis of that. Mm. Um, but really that's my style. My style is, um, I can't change, um, the trajectory of the company personally. Um, I can only change the trajectory of the company if, I have a hundred percent engagement from everybody in it. Hmm. I, you know, I made up a word. Okay. I don't know, 10 years ago and it's followable. Okay. And it, it, it strikes me, Jeff, that, but it strikes me, you are more than capable. You have, because of your experience, lots of capability, lots of ability to make a great decision good decisions, sometimes bad decisions, but you have the ability to make decisions. But what I'm sensing in terms of your style that has made you unique and has points to that, that low attrition rate is your followability or that you are followable. Um, and I, I'm, I sense that you really understand the difference. I, I don't know that everybody understands that difference. They think, well, I'm capable, so people will follow. But I just sense that you get that there is a difference between being capable and being followable. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, that, so here, that's the whole reason I quit Bristol Myers, right? Um, I won't, I won't name, call out a name here, but um, the president of the company wasn't followable, and uh, I had he wanted me to, you know, come be his right hand guy, and and. Uh, you know, I'm like, dude, I can't work for you. Um, you know, you don't make any sense. Right. Um, and so I left and I guess that's probably, um, there, there's a, a career, uh, making move, right. Is, mm -hmm. is, uh, who I don't want to be. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that guy. That's, uh, so focused on pennies. He's losing sight of the fact that we're saving lives, you know? Mm. Um, How do you, how do you impart that the awareness to leaders who report to you, who are leaders within your organization? How how have you found it imparting this idea of followability? Um, mm -hmm. How have you been able to do that? Um, it's it's simply coaching, right? Is um, 
you know, as you as you pump that down the system, right? They're they're already, you know, your your direct reports are are spending most of their time with you, and they're in the first month they're figuring out your style, mm-hmm. and uh, and what what you find is they tend to be very malleable, um, and geez, I'm gonna try that. You know, that that that, that sounds pretty cool, and uh, and as long as you as you keep you know hammering on that those types of points. Mm-hmm. Uh, being relevant, right? Um, you know, we're in a science industry. Um, I really don't care if an experiment doesn't work, right? Um, what I care about is that you have an understanding of why the experiment didn't work. Uh, failure is cool, but if you don't, only if only if you learn from it, right? So if you, if you gain knowledge from failure, it, that's awesome. And that, that's what we do. That's what scientists do. We're, we're wrong 90% of the time. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's learning from our, from those, um, those failures. And so that's, that's another thing, right. Is, is, um, coaching my staff, especially my scientific leaders, um, you know, don't be worried with a negative result, mm-hmm. right. Uh, bring knowledge from every experiment. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that, that's that's an important thing that I've always pushed. What mm. to do? And you, you talked there a second about your scientific leaders. There's mm-hmm. you know the that that leap from lab to leader. It, it's a it's a big jump. Yeah, it is. Uh, because you know when you were when you were getting your chemistry degree from Syracuse. I mm-hmm. doubt that they were teaching you about shareholder value and and about how to lead and being followable. What do you, what is essential, in your opinion, in making the jump from lab to leader? Mm-hmm. What's what's essential for you to either help develop in that person or they develop in themselves? What's that critical piece that that makes that jump successful? You know, it's it's really funny that you that you said it that way, right? Because you you and I'm laughing. My my PhD advisor Jim Kelmer, um, who eventually worked for me at Rondex, um, takes me aside one day when when we're at Rondex, and he says, "Jeff, you know, of all of my graduate students, you are the one that I would have assumed had the least chance of being successful." <laughs> <laughs> and and it was it, so the the point I'm, I'm trying to drive drive there is that um i think within the scientific disciplines especially um we yes we re, we we try to force strong scientists into management paths where they might not be wired for that right mm-hmm. and we and we, you know, do great science and you'll become the CEO. That's, that's not how it happens. You got to do, you got to have um, competency in, in, in science. You've got to be able to understand and carry on the dialogue. Um, but at the same time, you have to have um, those interpersonal skills, mm. right? Um, you know, uh, you got to be, it's kind of, it, you've got to be, you know, your leader of your company has got to be the nerd with interpersonal skills, right? Hmm. And there's very few nerds with interpersonal skills. Um, you know, I think I'm lucky to be one. Hmm. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, um, I think we make mistakes uh, in as we develop people by forcing them down um, pathways that you know we perceive as successful, right? Hmm. Um, I've got uh, you know some of my my favorite people. Um, I've been principal scientists in companies and I just uh, respect them beyond belief. Right. Um, some of my, you know, and, and also some CEOs, right. I've, I've mentioned, you know, a, a few here. Uh, there's others, you know, the flip side of that coin. Um, there's some CEOs that, you know, I wouldn't uh, cross the street for, you know, I guess, uh, um, you know, that, that that's, it's just how that goes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And finding that, finding that that way to to allow a 
a, a, an expert, a scientist, to stay in that track and not force her or him into leadership because that's the only way you can give them or the do you think that's the only way you can give them a promotion or mm -hmm. give them more money? Um, yeah. I think that's one of the, when I observe CEOs and senior leaders, those that really get that, the thing that you're pointing to, let, let great scientists be great scientists and find ways to reward them. And then, and then allow those that have the ability or the capacity to be followable, to be leaders, allow them to do that. That's a, that's a very unique ability to be able to see the talent and know what the right move is. And it also speaks to your relationship with them that you actually have a sense of what, what is going to best serve them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, and even beyond that, right. Um, you got to break the mold, right. Um, a lot of companies are hardwired for, you know, the only path to success is management. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got to, you've got to sit down with your HR uh, people and say, Hey, um, I want to have rock star scientists and, um, and they're worth every bit as much as my directors. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we've got to teach our managers that it's okay to be managing somebody that makes more money than you. Mm. Right. Um, you know, and if you don't like it, you know, uh, try to do their job. Yeah. And, uh, um, and so, you know, we, we, I've done that a few times and, and, um, uh, I've had, I've been very, very fortunate in um, some of the HR professionals that uh, I've had um, work with me over time. Um, some have followed me from company to company, right? Because they love that culture. Um, and, uh, and that's been great. Uh, you know, uh, most of them, it's kind of cool. Like I, I've got rules on, on social media, right? Um, I'm not involved with social media with any current employee, but all my past employees are Facebook friends. It's kind of cool. Um, and, uh, and we all keep up and happy birthdays and all that. Right. Um, so, uh, but yeah, that's, that's good stuff. Um, and those people are, uh, you know, breaking the mold. They love the idea that they could, they could do things a little different, right. Yeah. They were, they, you know, stepped up to the plate and broke that mold. Mm. That's yeah. It's, it's it's so helpful just to hear your real life experience of, of not that it was always easy. I can imagine there were tough conversations in there, but but yeah, really really helpful to hear your street level you know street level experience. Mm -hmm. Jeff, as we wrap up our conversation today, the last question that we always like to ask our guests is to put you in a time machine. And mm -hmm. take you back to a, a much earlier stage in your career and where you could pull yourself aside and give yourself some advice. Okay. If you could do that and pull your, your younger self aside, what would be that? What would that conversation entail? Um, I think the number one, um, the, the number one thing I've learned about people in the business world um is is kind of binary right um there are two types of people in the world uh there are people that create value and there are people that extract that value from others mm. and and it, it it transcends job titles it transcends uh career paths professional training you know uh um there's under i i truly you know coming out of a science lab right? I, I wasn't ready for this, this part of the world was um, understanding how to differentiate between those value creators and the value extractors. Hmm. And uh, I've had over the course of my career, I've had a number of value extractors um, get too deep into a company. And um, man, they, the damage that they can do is just un, unbelievable. And so early on, um, I would tell myself, focus, focus, focus on that first evaluation. Do they create value or do they extract it from others? Mm. Um, I kind of do that. I do that in interview questions now. 
right? Um, I, my favorite interview question for everybody that that, that sits in front of me is, uh, what problem in the world are you trying to solve, mm. right? Um, I don't care if they're the janitor, right? Are you trying to solve a problem? Um, and if you have an answer um, that's well thought out, you got a job. I don't, doesn't matter to me if if I agree with you or not, right? You're creating value, dude. Um, if, if they say, oh, I just want to, you know, make money so I can have this fancy house or fancy boat or I, I want, you know, those people, um, those people are anchors. Those people are anchors in our world. And, and uh, I, I, uh, I wish I knew that uh, back then as well as I do now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, really good advice. I love the binary distinction it's so helpful just to just to think just to think a little bit deeper about about who's in your world mm -hmm. jeff this is this has lived up to exactly what i thought it was going to be i've received so much and i i have, i'm going to imagine that those that are going to be listening are going to get a lot of insight from our time together if people want to connect with you and learn more about you where where can they find you um, well, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, LinkedIn, you know, Jeff Evans, LinkedIn, um, uh, Pacific, Pacific Pharmaceutical Services. It's uh, PacificPharmaServices.com. Um, you know, go to our website. Uh, you can, you can get to me, you know, there. And uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's been a pleasure, Jeff. I, I really appreciate um, the ability or the opportunity to share, right, to share with uh uh, you and, and, and your listeners, um, my experiences, and, and I hope folks can leverage that into something that's, uh, you know, uh, good for them and their world. Right? Yeah. And good Save for patients and good for patients. Let's not forget. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. I really appreciate thank, it. Thank you, Jeff.